So we are starting today's session talking about galactic physics at very high energies. So yesterday we learned about a little bit about the gamma ray astronomy, about the types of detectors, about how we classify and how we detect these gamma rays. And today I'm going to to walk you <laughs> through <laughs> to all of the different kind of emitters that we have in the galaxy. And also we will talk briefly about those emitters that we want to hunt and we want to, to detect. So <clears throat> yesterday I showed you this, that for the moment we have about 250 sources that emit in the very high energy regime. I don't know if I told you that this is actually one of uh, the, the catalog where you can uh, have a look to all of the sources, uh, the who detected it, who discovered it, and all of the related papers. So if you are interested, you can check that. And yesterday, I also told you that LASSO collaboration discovered new, more sources, so this number is already out of outdated. But basically, what you can see here is that blazars in red are the largest population uh, at TV energies, followed by supernova remnants and pulsar wind nebulae. But we will see that we have many kinds of uh, binary emitting at uh, very high energies. We have pulsars, we have other kinds of sources. So let's go through it. So uh, I'll be focusing today mainly in pulsar wind nebulae and especially the Crab Nebula, our standard candle, pulsars, uh, some hints on supernova remnants, a little bit of information on the galactic center, binary, some transient phenomena, and then there are other sources, but I don't have a lot of time <laughs> to, to go through all of it. So let's start. So. Yesterday we were saying that actually the very high energy, sorry, the high energy sky that uh, Fermi sees has much more sources that, than if you go to higher and higher energies. But still we have been getting a lot of new discoveries in the, uh, the around 100 TeV regime that I will show you uh, in a few minutes. So actually Brian's presentation this morning was perfect because I hope that you now know that this is Kase. He was talking this morning about the supernova remnant. He was talking uh, about diffuse, uh, <clears throat> diffuse shock acceleration, which is the perfect thing because I'm talking about that <laughs> the same. So, well, we already you already know this, so I will just go uh, real fast. So now we know that actually you can have particles accelerated via diffusion. Diff via diffusive shock acceleration in supernova remnants, and actually these particles can produce gamma rays. Um, something that is of high interest for us is that uh, uh, we could either have electrons, so leptonic processes, or protons, so hadronic processes, that could create these gamma rays. Uh, in order to, to understand uh, oh, the direct essence of search for the uh, either what we call the pion bump, okay, the pion bump uh, in the spectrum, okay, I will show you uh, now uh, what it is, that is measured at GV energies, or we can either try to find this, uh, what I briefly mentioned yesterday, what we call tevatrons, which are sources that are able to accelerate particles at two PV energies in the, in, uh, in the galactic cosmic ray spectrum, for the acceleration of protons. So uh, in the case of supernova remnants, so if we want to know if we are uh, measuring gamma rays that have a hadronic origin, first thing we can do is to uh, look the around uh, uh, MEVs or GEVs and see if we can measure this uh, inverse Compton uh, bump or this, in, uh, sorry, or this uh, inverse Compton uh, peak, and then we can go to be, try to go to very, very, very high energies and see if there is any cutoff on the spectra or if it's still a power law or the, more or less what Brian told us this morning. So, for example, how do we do this? Because this gam the, the spectra that you measure in ele from electrons and from prot protons is slightly different. Here you have the what, it would, what you would measure if you would have protons or if you have leptons for the case of IFC-433 and for the case of W44. Oh, I don't know why I put this one here. It's not this one. So you can see here that the Fermi observations, let me put again this video because it was too fast and I was talking too much. 
Um, so let's see again. So if you see the Fermilat em emission, this, which are these uh, pink points that will appear shortly, and you try to fit with, the, with a leptonic scenario or in yellow, or with a hadronic scenario in blue, you see that in this case, at Fermi energies, you can really fit well to a hadronic, to a proton uh, scenario. So this is the first indication that tells us that some supernovae remnants actually accelerate protons. So for the moment, it's OK. Oh, we are positive in, with, the, with the idea that some supernova remnants could indeed be sources of uh, cosmic rays. So uh, this is a kind of a similar plot that uh, Brian showed this morning for the cosmic ray spectrum. And the idea is that if what we really want to know is where are, where are these spectrums, these sort of particles energies, because if we find a pevatron that accelerates protons up to these very high energies, we would be unveiling which are the sources that, that accelerate these cosmic rays up to those very high energies. So the thing is that to have, uh, if you have a, 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 a particle that it's uh, accelerated up to PV energies, you can expect to measure proton, uh, photons up of around 100 tera electron volts, okay? So if you detect a photon that has 100 tera electron volts, you know that the particles that produce it had around PV energies. So this would be like the, 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 the great final, let's say, uh, proof that uh, this source is a pevatron. Um, so going back to Casey, uh, so Brian mentioned that it's a really young supernova remnant. It has around 300 years. And for example, with Cherenkov telescopes, we have been trying to search for pevatrons uh, uh, for many years. And in our efforts, for example, we measured here the emission. You can see this is the, the spectrum. This is in blue measured by Fermilat and in, in black by, by Magic. And you can see actually that there is a cutoff, as we heard this morning. So this source only goes up to 3.5, there is a cutoff at 3.5 tera electron volts and the emission doesn't go higher. So it's not a pevatron. Mm -hmm. It's not one of the sources that we expect to contribute much to the, galact to, to the overall galactic uh, cosmic ray spectrum. However, we can see as fit in the overall SED, we can say that the protons are likely dominating the TeV emission, the very high energy emission, because we have a better fit to the hadronic scenario. But the thing is that, like this, we prove that Casse was not a pevatron. So, however, in the last few years, there, ha there are these uh, particle detectors of these extensive air shower detectors, such as uh, Hawk, Lasso, and this was uh, two years ago already. There was already uh, some uh, potential pevatron supernova remnant seen in the highest energy gamma rays by the Tibet uh, collaboration. Uh, so there were some hints that supernova remnants can indeed contribute or not. And one of the highlight uh, discoveries, I would say, in the last years is actually these uh, results by the LASO collaboration that you remember as these the detectors that are in China, where they said that they detected two uh, gamma ray sources at ultra high energies, so reaching 1.5 beta electron volts. So, which are these sources that you can see in here. And, uh, <coughs> Well, you can see uh, the distribution in the galactic plane, uh, the exposure time. Uh, basically, they detected this in the first year of operation. So absolutely a, an amazing <laughs> result. And uh, they, they claim that they detected about 500 photons at above 100 tera electron volts. So you really see we count photons, right? <laughs> we are able to count the photons. We have so, so little in our energy ranges. Um, most of them are associated with pulsar wind nebulae, with pulsars. And uh, uh, what does it mean? We briefly, I think also Brian briefly mentioned that pulsars are, uh, are 
leptonic accelerators. So most of these sources are likely, so they are pevatrons, so they accelerate uh, particles up to PV energies, but they accelerate mainly electrons, what it looks like. There are some, there, I think there mm, were some uh, my, maybe associations with our supernova remnants, but the error or the, 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 the exactly, exactly, the, the, um, the accuracy that they ha that they have to 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 claim from where it's coming from it's really large because the 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 their PSF is actually pretty big so it's a bit d difficult sometimes to claim you can have several sources in the same um, being associated with the same source so is not really clear. But as, as I mentioned, basically, uh, if you look at this paper, you see that it's pulsar wind nebulae, pulsars, etc. And you can see here that actually they detected it with a very high significance, uh, always around seven minimum. And here you see the, the, sorry, and here you see what the maximum what the energies of the maximum, uh, sorry, the maximum energies that they detected it, okay? Uh, you can see that the highest photon that they detected has an energy of 1.4 peta electron volts that is coming from this l source called LASO J2032. And keep it in mind because later we will be talking to something related to this source. Um, this is just simply the list of the possible associations that you can have in here. And you can see here, for example, the Crab Nebula, uh, uh, or this source that I just tell you that we will see is a Pulsar Wind Nebula associated with a binary system. Uh, but as I mentioned, mainly Pulsar Wind Nebula and Pulsar. And exactly yesterday they published the that we need to update the catalog. Uh, reading the paper, what we see is that seven of these 32 new sources do not have any association. So they haven't found any counterpart at lower energies. Eight of them have uh, GV counterparts. So they have been uh, uh, associated with Fermilat sources. 16 are pulsar or, person win, uh, or supernova remnants association. And they claim that one of them is extragalactic. And out of these 90 sources, 43 of them are now per pevatrons, okay? Uh, they claim about four sigma. I told you yesterday that we normally say five sigma to claim a detection, but all of these sources have been detected with very high significance at 25 tera electron volts. So they said, okay, if there are already really strong emitters at 25 tera electron volts and we see a four sigma signal at least minimum in at 100 TV, so they'll be there. So maybe just a little bit of more of time, in the exposure time, and we will detect them with a little bit more. And out of these, eight have never been detected uh, in, the, in the energy regime between 1 and 25 tera electron volts. So these are really dominant at higher energies. And you can see, f so this is the plot uh, from the previous slide from last year, and now this is what the lasso sky looks like. So actually, we have a lot of sources emitting around 100 tera electron volts, which is, personally to me, it's a big, big surprise. So it's good to know that the, that the field is really evolving. And this is a, a, a photo I took of Brian's slide this morning. <laughs> and so. <laughs> where he, he was mentioning, he was discussing a little bit like, uh, like uh, 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 above the need you require special sources, microwaves of massive stellar classes, something in the galactic center. Uh, so what we just saw from the LASO results is that most of the sources are mainly associated with pulsar wind nebulas, with pulsars, with have a leptonic uh, origin in general. There are likely some associations with supernova remnants. I must say, I, 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 I read real fast the, the, the paper, so, um, so if, but these associations to me were not so, so, so clear. I think we would need a little bit more time to see, to see if they are, these associations are real. There is one association to a massive star cluster, which is exactly connected to this source that I told you to remember. So, uh, so conclusion, we still don't know what's going on here. 
So there is still a lot of things that to understand about what are the sources that contribute to galactic cosmic rays. But the cool thing is that we are starting to measure a lot of pebatrons. So I guess, or I hope that at some point we will get to know better about this. Uh, and just to show you again, so these are the, the, <coughs> the sensitivities of some detectors right now uh, and some future detectors. So uh, you rem remember Hawk in Mexico? This is the five-year sensitivity. And actually, you can see that Lasso in only one year has a much better sensitivity. That's why, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So it's with Cherenkov ra uh, radiation, but if you remember, these particle detectors, they, they do not measure how uh, the propagation in the atmosphere. So they, det they detect the secondary particles from the, from the cascade in the atmosphere, but then they measure how this particle interacts with the water tanks that they have, and that's what they, what they measure. And in here, indeed, I didn't got into too many details. Uh, so these are detections with the with the particle detectors itself. They also have like a small uh, Cherenkov uh, telescopes, and the Cherenkov telescopes are th that they have they measure in these energy ranges. But basically, these detections were the, with these detectors. Yeah. Yeah. So these are uh, so these are the ones that arrive at the atmosphere. Yeah. If I remember correctly. Okay. So yeah. So that's why Lasso is obtaining really great results because they have a, a very good sensitivity. So let's move briefly to the galactic center. So you have that in our in the center of our ga galaxy. We have this Sagittarius A uh, uh, um, supermassive black hole. And actually, Sagittarius A uh, is the first uh, hadronic pebatron that we have ever detected. This was a discovery that uh, has uh, made in, 2000, in 2016. And, uh, here you can see some uh, measurement of the diffuse uh, emission, uh, of the diffuse emission that, the, the, that is measured there. And the origin of this diffuse emission could be due to the interaction of the cosmic rays that are coming from the central black hole with probably with the interstellar medium or some cosmic ray, so, so some cosmic ray acceleration near the so-called uh, molecular uh, cloud. And, um, yeah, and something that I told you yesterday briefly is that uh, near uh, in Sagittarius A, uh, well, sorry, Sagittarius A, no, sorry, that Fermi actually measured these bubbles uh, in 2011 that are so called the Fermi, the Fermi bubbles, and they claim that there could be some remnants of this uh, Sagittarius A emission. And it's the mechanism, as far as I know, is still not known if it's hadrons or if it's uh, inverse Compton on the CMB photons. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know if there is any new paper related to this. I, I'll have to check. But for the moment, the only confirmed hadronic pevatron that we know in the galaxy is uh, the galactic center. And then the galactic center, there are many things ongoing. Sometimes you have... Ah, this is small video of the Fermi bubbles. So, uh, so we have seen that supernova remnants, some of them have a, a hadronic emission, but they might be associated to pebatrons. Uh, but what we know for sure is that pulsar wind nebulae are also uh, pebatrons accelerating electrons. And the most famous for us is the Crab Nebula. Um, here you can see actually the Crab Nebula is hosting this pulsar inside. And actually we detect both the nebula and the pulsations from the central pulsar. So uh, Crab is the, so, okay, the pulsar, this is the, Accre the accretion disk, the jet, another jet. Okay, so actually, Crab Nebula is the standard candle for TV astronomy. Um, 
Uh, here you have the Fermilat and the very high energy emission, and it's really well fit with a um, with the electronic scenario. And actually, the cool thing is that the me the the spectra of the Crab Nebula has been measured up to uh, 100 tera electron volts. It has been measured uh, not only by detectors, but also with with Cherenkov telescopes. We have this technique of observing near the horizon which I told you briefly yesterday, like this we increase our collection area and we can get to very high energy. So actually, for example, MAGIC has detected the Crab Nebula up to 100 tera electron volts. So there is no evidence of a cutoff and this means that it's also a pebatron, but for the case of leptons. And here this is also a nice result from HES where they really measure the size of the very high energy emission uh, from, from crab. The, the, they really determine the region, the size of the region. And inside you see the, the Chandra image. So, well, this is just to show you what I was telling you of this very large semi-tangled technique. If you look at, the, if you look at a shower that is, uh, that is on top of you, uh, your collection area is much smaller, but if you go to, to higher zenith angles, your collection area increases and you can detect all of these super energetic, uh, super energetic show showers. So at Zenit, your collection area is about 0 0.05 kilometers square, and if you go real large zenith angle, you get two kilometers square. So this is a technique that we have been using lately to try to go to as, to as high in energy as possible for certain sources of our interest. But however, CRAP is full of surprises. We have been studying it for many, many years, not only us, but also Fermilat. It has been observing it over for a long time. And actually, both Fermilat and Agile detected an increase in the emission of CRAP. <coughs> you can see here, this is a CRAP nebula normal state, and this is a flaring state. What is the mechanism behind? We know we, it's a leptonic for sure. Uh, uh, could be maybe that you have these PV electrons rapidly cooling. Uh, well, it's just, we don't see any variability in X-rays. We do not have measured yet any variability at very high energies. Um, so we are still very eager to see if we are able to detect one of these flaring emissions. So what we could expect is that either if you try to go as low in, in energy, you can maybe try to catch if there is some synchrotron tail. Maybe you can try to catch the synchrotron tail during a flaring state. Or maybe it could happen that uh, there is even a higher component, an inverse Compton component. If you remember yesterday, I showed you a, a plot where you could see that synchrotron no, always normally is shapes the spectrum at lower energies. and norm inverse content normally at higher energies. So we are really trying to get uh, one of these flaring uh, uh, episodes of crap at very high energies, because indeed, we have never been uh, seeing a flaring pulsar wind nebula. So this is trying something we are trying to, to do. And as I told you, uh, in the center of the crab nebula, there is a pulsar. Uh, in total, there are, this is maybe a bit outdated, but so I just want you to keep the general numbers in mind. So there are about 2,200 radio pulsars. Out of them, 300 are high energy pulsars, but at very high energies, we have only detected pulsations from three systems, which are the CRAB, Bel Bella, and Jeminga. And the thing is that in general, these pulsars have a, uh, a cutoff at few giga electron volts, as you can see in here. So it's really difficult to, de to detect these pulsars at, at higher energies, unless you go down in your system at very low energies, or unless they have a second component. So these are the three pulsars that have been detected at very high energies. And uh, as you can see, the cool thing is that they have very different ages. So CRAP uh, is the youngest one. It exploded in 1050. Uh, uh, Bella is an intermediate age pulsar. And Jeminga is a very old one. It's, it has about 300,000 uh, uh, years. And you can see that the rotation periods are completely different, so it's actually pretty cool that we have detected three pulsars so different among each other. Uh, 
So the story, the, the, I would say that the one that has, we have been studied the most is a, a crab. It was detected, the pulsation was detected already in 2008, uh, above uh, 25 giga electron volts. Ah, sorry, there is a question. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, no. That, that I know, yeah, that I know, no. If someone else knows, please, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so in 2008, uh, it was first detected uh, in the range between 2,500 giga electron volts. Then uh, the second detection was at even higher energies. And this is cool because uh, there, are many, there were many theories that say that you could not have uh, emission above the center level from pulsars. So every time you increase the detection energy, you were ruling out one of these theories. Uh, then it was detected at 2400. Then uh, you d we detected something that we call the bridge emission, but I'm not going into details there. And then uh, the, f the final uh, paper that was published was uh, the detection of the, you have, so this is the shape of the pulsations. You have, uh, this is P2, this is P1. These are the two different pulses that you detect. And when you measure the spectrum of P1 in black and P2 in blue, you can see that actually you can measure the, their spectra up to TeV energies. So this really, as I told you, rules out many, uh, many theories of where your emission could be produced, and it opens a lot of questions or where they can be, uh, where your emission come from. And as, f as far as I know, there is no model that, that can really explain right now the presence of TV pulsations, but they are working on that. So HES uh, detected uh, the, the Bella pulsar, um, which, we, which is this middle age pulsar, uh, in the range between 20 and 80 giga electron volts. They detected it with a very big telescope that they have, that is called HES2. Uh, here you can see the pulsation, and here you can see the, uh, the spectral butterfly uh, in red that they measure. And actually some years ago, in a conference I was, they show uh, another spectra saying that they had detected it at, at very, very high energies, about TV energies. But uh, I haven't seen any paper yet since, since that, but uh, you will see that there are some models uh, talking about possible TV emission from Bella. So, uh, yes, we are looking forward for this paper. <laughs> because it's very interesting. And the other pulsar that we have in the community is Jeminga, is the, the oldest that has been detected. Um, uh, yeah, I put the here, middle-aged one, I think. Well, okay, I have to check. Uh, yeah, but you can see that we have detected it in, the, in at low energies at 15 giga electron volts. So in general, I told you that Cherenkov telescopes measure above 100 giga electron volts, but then we have ten techniques and we have special triggers that we can lower and lower our threshold. So magic in this case could even reach with a special trigger that we have that is called some trigger. It's because of how the the how you you classify the the let's say the events in the camera and how you do the cleaning of the image. You can really lower your threshold, and here we detected it uh, at 15 giga electron volts. And uh, yeah, so there are several models. Uh, I will not get get too much into detail. So here is your pulsar. Okay, and these are the, the magnetic field lines. So uh, you ha there is a point in which your magnetic field lines open, okay? And you can have several regions where you could expect your very high and your gamma ray emission come from, which is what we call the polar cap or the outer gap or this other here that I don't remember right now the name, I'm sorry. <laughs> the, this, that? A slot gap, ah, thank you, you know? These theoreticians, <laughs> they know all of this. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I, I was checking, the, so if you check this paper by Hardin et al, they predict that indeed you can have three different very high energy components. So uh, you can have some uh, synchrotr synchrotron from the, uh, so in the case of Bella and Jeminga, 
which you remember we were detected at very low energies, uh, what you could be measuring is the synchrotron, the synchrotron tail that is extending up to a few hundred GeV. Uh, then in the case of CRAP, they, they claim that the TV emission that we measure is actually synchrotron self-quantum. So when you have synchrotron emission and these photons then interact with another electron and it's upscattered via uh, uh, inverse quantum. And then uh, they claim that at, at more than TV, more than 10 TV, you could have also some, some inverse quantum on some other, uh, on the primary particles. And this would explain, for example, this Bella uh, emission that uh, in principle was detected at few TVs that we show in that conference. So you see, three pulsars, uh, have given us a lot of information, but still there is a there is a lot that we need to understand from them. And connected to pulsars, so we have seen now uh, that we are able to detect the pulsar with nebulas. No, we detect also the central pulsar. And a discovery that was also really cool in the last years is that the existence of what we call TV halos. This was a discovery that was done by, Ho by the Hawk collaboration. Uh, they detected like uh, two very extended gamma ray sources around the Jeminga pulsar and this other pulsar B0665. Uh, um, the, the, their emission can be described by a single power law extended up to 40 tera electron volts. And this means that you would have electrons uh, up to 100 TeVs uh, that, that are the result of the inverse quantum scattering of the cosmic microwave background uh, photons. Um, why is this also uh, interesting, this discovery? Because uh, uh, some, for example, the AMS collaboration, which is, uh, detects uh, cosmic rays in the International Space Station, you can see here this result by them. This is the, the so-called positron spectrum. And you can see here that you have a diffuse some, diff some diff diffuse terms, some diffuse contribution, and you can have some contribution here that is coming from sources. So this, uh, the authors of this uh, detection, uh, from their observations, they saw that basically uh, the emission is coming from electrons and or, or, pos and, or positrons, and uh, they said that actually they do not think that this is contributing substantially, that these two pulsars are contributing substantially to this positron bump. But uh, there are still some debates in the community. There are people in the community that they say that indeed, yes, that actually this, uh, uh, you can actually fit, for example, the, the Jeminga in here perfectly and that you can, uh, they can explain, explain this, elect, uh, this positron bump. So how are these TV halos so, um, produced? So they are produced by these uh, uh, relativistic electrons that are being diffused into the interstellar medium. So basically, it's just that you have this halo of particles that are uh, surrounding these pulsars. And here is just some, some schematics of what uh, of some possible explanation. So uh, after the after the after the after the supernova explosion, you get your supernova supernova remnant. You have your pulsar wind nebula here that, in principle, is free expanding in the first 10 kilo years, more or less, and has not been affected by this uh, by the by the by the reverse shock that you will get from your supernova remnant at some point between 10 and 100 kilo years this reverse shock will really interact with the pulsar wind nebula and the system will start slowly getting away from the parent supernova nebula and at some point after a very long time like 100 kilo years the pulsar leaves the parent the parent supernova remnant and that's when you have all of these free particles that come that can diffuse in the interstellar medium and produce this TV halo that Hawk detected. And 
something also uh, interesting from the, the from the catalog that Lasso released yesterday is that they claim that they have detected around three uh, around 35 uh, TB halos. So before we had around two, and now we have 30 something more. So a lot of interesting things. Um, okay, magnetars. Okay, now we have talked about pulsar wind nebulae, about their pulsars, about the TV halos, and now we are talking about a little another kind of neutron star, which are magnetars. So, you know that magnetars are these really magnetized ne neutron stars that they sometimes display, or they sometimes no, they display different kinds of outbursts and flares. So they have extreme magnetic fields, so above 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15. So they they are the, the like the cosmic uh, uh, um, cosmic m uh, magnets, and it's it's calculated. It is thought that about 10 percent of supernova explosion will result in magnetars. Okay. Um, they rotate slower than pulsars. So if you remember the the uh, crab and the others, I think it was uh, around millisecond duration, the, the rotation. Magnetars have a rotation of about a second. And in the Milky Way, we know about 30 of these magnetars. So the interesting thing of the magnetars is that here it seems that the magnetic field is like super stable, super whatever, but it, it actually it's not, okay? The, the, you, in the case of magnetars, their magnetosphere gets twisted because you have like magneto earthquakes, I would say. So you, they, will ha they have these super powerful magnetic fields which are twisted and, and, and th this creates a lot of tension and this creates a lot of outbursts at different time scales as we will see. So a normal pulsar would have these magnetic fields like, like this and the magnetar basically have it in a funny way. Okay. Um, so um, Pulsars in general, you have these two jets emitting radio pulsations, while in the case of magnetars, you do not expect this, uh, this, uh, these jets. There, are some there, there have been lately some discoveries also, in which sometimes you have rotational power pulsars, in which you also have like magnetic, mag magnetar like events. So there are now different theories whether they are like the two. two two sides of the same coin, or if it's an uh, evolutionary thing, or, or whatever. Uh, but we are not getting into, into too many details because it's not the scope of this talk today. But again, just to, for a comparison, this is the magnetic field that you expect in a magnetar, and this is the typical magnetic field of a, of a, of a rotational power pulsar. So you can expect, uh, you can measure three different types of bursts in magnetars depending on the, on, the, on the duration and the intensity. So uh, the most common ones are the short bars. Uh, they last uh, less than a second and their energy re release is about 10 to the 41. Uh, then you have intermediate bars that they last a little bit more up to 40 seconds and their energy budget is a bit uh, bigger, 10 to the, up to 10 to the 43. And then you have giant flirts, which are the most energetic ones, as about uh, 10 to the 44 or even more. Um, and then you see that you have an initial peak and, uh, and then you have some, some kind of uh, wiggles or, uh, or f funny, uh, uh, funny shape afterwards, okay? And the thing is that giant flares are really rare, okay? We will see now. Um, so, uh, Intermediate flares, you can measure them in X-rays. When you get intermediate flares, you can have this burst of this forest of bursts where you measure like a lot of X-rays in just few seconds. Uh, we, we will keep this in mind because tomorrow I will be talking about something that could be connected uh, to this, okay? Uh, and then giant flares, well, they are really rare, as I said. So in the last 
30 years of measuring the, the gamma ray sky, uh, we have had about three uh, giant flares in the galaxy. So that's why I said that they are really rare, one per decade, and they are also short. They can last one minute, they can extend a little bit, this, this kind of wiggle thing can extend a little bit. And their energy release, as I said, is really high, between 10 to the 44, 10 to the 47. So these are the, the, the three uh, detections in the last, uh, in the last decades. Uh, in 1979, in, eight, in 1998, and in 2004. And you can see more or less what I was telling you. No? You have this initial peak, and then you, you have this kind of uh, a structure. And this structure, uh, as we were mentioning, can last for hundreds of seconds, maybe up to a few minutes, etc. So, uh, uh, give me one second. So, this, uh, this uh, giant flares, where, where they were located, so two of them in the galaxy, one in the large Magellanic cloud, and And the thing is that from other galaxies, you can actually also detect giant flares. Sometimes they can be, they can get confused with uh, other, sorry, I'm, I'm listening to someone talking here, I think. Uh, <laughs> so, so sometimes it's a bit tricky to understand if it was a giant flare or if it was another kind of event. Uh, but something, uh, also a very nice discovery that was already three years ago, was uh, done on April 15 of 2020. There was a giant flare in, the, uh, in another galaxy. And uh, yeah, and this is what I was telling you. So you, you would expect this peak and this uh, kind of afterglow, but when you locate your, your source super far away, your shape changes a little bit. Okay, so sometimes it's why it's a bit tricky to understand if it's really a giant flare from a magnetar or not. But in this case, they confirmed that it was a that it was a magnetar in another galaxy. So there were some some alerts you can see here uh, in X-rays and Fermi GVM also detected it. So it was a duration of about 140 milliseconds. Okay, it rises super fast in only. 77 picoseconds, it was the race as measured by Fermi GVM. And what I think it's also a, a highlight of the last few years at, uh, for galactic physics is that Fermilab detected three high energy photons, okay? Uh, <laughs> 480 mega electron volts, 1.3 giga electron volts, and 1.7 giga electron volts. It looks like nothing, but it's actually a lot. This is telling us that indeed, yeah, giant flares can accelerate uh, gamma rays. Uh, and this was in another galaxy. So if you get a galactic magnetar emitting, uh, 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 having a giant flare, you might be able to detect it at even higher energies. Um, so they think that the emission comes from the, from the dissipation. So they think that there is some material next to the magnetar from other previous uh, outbursts, etc., and that this emission comes from these relativistic outflows that interact with that, with that material. Uh, well, in the paper, of course, with three photons, you cannot do, obtain much uh, spectra or whatever, but it was already a really cool, uh, uh, this would be the, so the idea is that you have this, uh, the, this outflow and then it shocks and this is what they measure. And of course, at higher energies, we have been searching for magnetar flares. Um, indeed, our telescopes could detect 
if there is some uh, TV emission, as some models predict, we could be able to detect them. And also, some, uh, some telescopes, some Cherenkov telescopes, have a central photomultiplier that is uh, adapted to exactly uh, measure optical emission. And the good thing is that they, since they are super fast, they can really measure uh, up to millisecond signals. So if these giant flares not only emit uh, uh, TV emission, but if they also emit this optical flaring, the super short flaring, we would be able to detect them. But let me tell you that, for example, we have been doing some campaigns um, in a magnetar, in a galactic magnetar called uh, SGR 1935. Remember this, na this name because tomorrow uh, I will be talking about it a little bit more. Um, <coughs> But let me tell you that for the moment, well, uh, we have not detected any very high energy emission. Eh? So for example, sometimes in x-rays, they see this, uh, this uh, outburst, and we, in a joint campaign with some radio uh, colleagues, some optical colleagues, we have not detected anything. So for the moment, magnetars are still uh, uh, avoiding us at very high energies. And uh, for the moment, we have not detected a giant flare, optical bars, intermediate flares, uh, or FRBs, which is a bit of a hint to what we will be talking tomorrow. And tomorrow, you will see why I put this uh, fast radio burst thing here. Okay, what other sources? So gamma ray binaries or gamma loud binaries. So this is one of the, also the, the, the main topics of my, my research. So there are many different kinds of binary systems in the, in the galaxy, you already know. I have tried to put in here more or less a, a classification of, of the systems, of the different type of systems that we can have. So microquasars, when you have a, a compact object that is accreting material from a companion star, normally it's a black hole or a neutron star, depending on the, on the size of the, of the, the size, no, of the mass of the companion star, we can divide it in, in massive microquasars when you have a massive companion star, low mass uh, X-ray binaries or low mass microquasars when the companion is a low mass star, and it has also been detected the, the, what, what is a unique system in the galaxy, which is a B star, so it's a massive star. This B, if you remember massive stars, they are uh, pretty hot, they have a strong winds, and they, uh, in the case of B stars, you have a circumstellar material that is coming from the, from, the, from the fast rotation of the star, the material accumulates around it, okay? And this is the only B star that has a black hole as a companion, okay? This was actually a very cool... Um, discovery some years ago by some colleagues uh, um, because according to evolution, uh, uh, to a stellar evolution, you would not expect, you would expect between zero and one of these systems. For the moment we have one and uh, now the models have changed and they predict a little bit more, so they are searching for, for more. So. Uh, binary systems, we could have these microquasars, so uh, in having a massive or a low mass companion being accreted into a compact object. Then we can also have um, uh, the case in which you, instead of having accretion, you can have a massive star which is being uh, uh, orbited by a neutron star. And in this case, you have the wind of the binary with all of these uh, uh, electrons from the pulsar, and it's in the in the shock region between the between the two winds, let's say, uh, between the wind of the binary and the electrons, where you can have some emission, some very high energy emission. Novi, uh, when you have a star that is accreting into a white dwarf, um, these are kinds of transient events. Um, and then we could also expect to find some emission from what it's called transitional millisecond pulsars. Fermi has detected three of them. So these pulsars are systems which are uh, also accreting material from a, from a companion star and uh, they change states. So there is a part of their cycle in which they, be they behave as a 
radio loud neutron star and at some point it changed its behaviors and it start accreting material from the companion and it has these jets emitted. So uh, Fermi, as I said, has detected three of them when they are in this phase. So in this phase for the moment there is no detection. Then there are other systems like these black widows in which, in which you have a, like a, like a, a, a pulsar and a companion star that is a kind of orbiting in this spiral orbit towards the, the pulsar and the pulsar is like ripping off uh, the companion star away. And then you have colliding wind binaries, which is basically two massive stars, like a luminous blue variable, like Eta Carina. I'm, I'm sure you are familiar with this system. So in this system, you can you also uh, ins, uh, can detect uh, very high energy emission. So you see that in general, we have a lot of systems, and I have already told you more or less that some we have detected, some not. So why are these systems interesting? Well. Let me just show you briefly. So, um, <coughs> officially, okay, when we talk about gamma ray binaries, so all of these are, are binaries, and then we talk about gamma ray binaries, we only refer to gamma ray binaries as those systems in which the bulk of the non thermal emission is located in the gamma ray regime. Okay, this was the definition. The f this is the official definition, and this is what uh, what I learned when I was doing my PhD. But of course, we didn't have so many systems at that time as we have now. And um, uh, well, right now we have ten systems. Okay, this is sorry for this slide is a bit uh, outdated. So out of about 300 X-ray binaries, we have detected only ha uh, only ten of what we call gamma ray binaries, okay? With the peak of the non-thermal emission in the, in the MEV regime. And of course, there are, mm, there are still many open questions that we are trying to solve because all of these systems, uh, they are not, they have a lot of similarities and at the same time not. But we will see here that now, um, as I mentioned earlier, we have detected more systems. So this was in uh, 2014, the situation when I finished my PhD. You see that, in that at that time we only have five gamma ray binaries. All of them are, uh, have a massive companion star, so O type or B type. And at that time we only knew that one of them was hosting a pulsar. And then you see that the eccentricities are very different, that the orbital periods are very different, or the part in the orbit where you detect uh, very high energy emission, this, the P means in the periastron, so when the two uh, uh, objects are close by, or in the apastron, or in other parts of the orbit. I don't, don't get this, uh, uh, don't, it's not needed that you take uh, such a detailed look. But now the situation, is a little bit uh, better. If you see now, we have much more of the what we call gamma ray binaries. So the non-thermal emission is really peaking in the in the gamma ray regime. But then we have some other high energy emitters or some other gamma loud emitters. Okay, so binaries that they also emit at some point gamma rays, but they don't. But not is not the the, the, the bulk of the non-thermal emission. And what you see here is that now the thing starts to change a little bit. So we have three microquasars, three confirmed microquasars, uh, Cygnus X1 and Cygnus X3. Uh, you can see here that they have been detected at high energies by Fermilat, but they have not been detected at very high energies. And indeed, we only have one confirmed microquasar, which is SS433, that has been detected both at low energies and at very high energies. Then it was recently um, uh, claimed but, uh, by Hawk the detection of B4641 Sagittarius, which would be a microblazer. So it's a microquasar that has the jets pointing toward us. For the moment, theoretically, there are only two or three of them in the galaxy, okay? So if this is really uh, confirmed, uh, it would be a very cool result. Then we have a colliding wind binary, Eta Carina, that also emits at high energies and at very high energies, and we have a nova. And uh, 
out of the known gamma ray binaries, now we know that we have another system that is another uh, 143 millisecond pulsar. We have another system that has been identified as a pulsar, likely a magnetar. And there is this one here that some uh, authors claim that it's also a magnetar. Some others don't believe very much uh, of this result, so it's a bit under debate. But you see that in only a few years, the situation has really evolved, and now we know a lot of different kinds of systems emitting at very high energies. And why it has been it's so difficult to determine if gamma ray binaries are uh, are microquasars, are accreting material into a black hole, or if, if we are here in this radio pulsar scenario. Because, of course, if you were here, you were expecting to detect pulsations. No, it's like, okay, if you have a pulsar, you should detect pulsations, like you detect from the Crab Nebula. And if you have a microquasar, you should detect the jets, no? like, you, like you detect in many systems. Well, the thing is that we do not detect pulsations, so we do not detect jets, okay? In, any of the of the gamma ray binaries that we have been detecting uh, and the thing is that uh, well uh, regarding the emission in general in this kind of systems uh, what we measure is inverse quantum so there is inverse quantum on the on the photons that are provided by the by the by the star and in the case of microquasars there are two scenarios possible, you could have inverse contour or you can have hadronic emission uh, in the jet. So this is the first gamma ray binary that was uh, detected in 2005 by, 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 um, by HESS. It's in a three-year orbit and in here you see you have this B star and the disk is in this position and then you have the pulsar that crosses the disk and then it crosses again the disk. And it's ne here in this area near the periastron where, you where the pulsar is at the closest of the, of the star where you detect the very high energy emission because of course it's here where you have the photons uh, that then are upscattered. Then um, the second uh, binary in which we detected that, the, that, that we could confirm that it was a pulsar was the system 2032. It's a system that it has an orbit of 50 years. So we detected it, uh, I think it was uh, 2018 or 17, 17. Uh, so next passage will be, uh, I'll probably re be retired, hopefully. <laughs> so, and the thing is that uh, this pulsar actually, when it's here in this region, is uh, illuminating a pulsar wind nebula. And this pulsar wind nebula is one of these pevatron sources that Lasso sees, okay? And this is also located near um, 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 a star forming region called the Cygnus OV. So, but when this pulsar really gets close to its star, like in the previous case, it emits uh, f fireworks of gamma rays. Um, yeah, and then as I was saying, well, the, if you remember, there are all these other two sources. And it's like, okay, in general, there's always, uh, they ha there's always a bit, a uh, lot of discussion. If you have a microquasar scenario, if you have a pulsar, and uh, for example, in my career, I have been l studying for a long time this binary that is called LS1 plus ST1303. We have been trying uh, with the gamma ray measurements. Okay, we do not detect pulsations. We do not see anything, but we have been trying to check some theories to see if it was a pulsar or not, and uh, but the but the confirmation that it's a pulsar came uh, just uh, last year, uh, where they detected with the fast telescope pulsations on the binary. The pulsations are not periodic, so they observed for several nights. They did not detect any sing any any signal, but they only detected signal during one night. Okay. And uh, actually, they they think that is uh, indeed a magnetar because of the, the because of the of the period. You have a period of 0 0.27, 0 0.27 seconds. So you remember, magnetar has a have a longer period than 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 radio loud pulsars, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And uh, according to some, to some colleagues, uh, about up to 10% of galactic magnetars could be in a binary system. So magnetars are a bit everywhere right now, if you, s if you see it. Uh, 
curiosities about microquasars. Microquasars have, uh, do not always have to have their jets active. There are some microquasars than, than, than do, but others display flaring emission, okay? And they follow this diagram. This is the, X, the luminosity in X-rays, and this is the spectral hardness. So when they are, they start from this quiescent state, uh, at some point the X-ray luminosity increases a little bit, uh, a, a, a little bit a lot. Um, and there you have your jets, which are emitted. And then at some point your, lum X, your luminosity stays constant, but your spectral hardness starts to go softer and softer. And then your uh, jet starts disappearing. And then you start to come back to the previous state, okay? So many of the observations that we are doing at very high energies is to really try to get these uh, systems when they have their jets active. Because it's, if you have the jets, you could have their uh, protons, you could have other, uh, uh, you could have electrons, and they uh, are accelerated in the jet, and there is where you could expect some gamma ray emission. So here it's uh, so. For example, this is a, a, a image of what uh, Cygnus X1 would be. So you have your companion star that provides your uh, your uh, optical and ultraviolet uh, photons, the, accre the accretion disk that is basically uh, detected in optical and ultraviolet X-rays. Then you can have the corona here that is measuring hard X-rays, and then the jets that are measuring uh, in a lot of different. Uh, uh, state and well, this is the same I show you now, and uh, and yeah, for the moment we know about 20 microquasars in the galaxy, but the population study says that they could be up to 150. And this system was very famous because it was the first, uh, well, this was the first uh, black hole that was uh, ever detected, and and. Uh, Kip Thorne was actually saying that it was a black hole, and he was saying that he, uh, Hawking was saying that it was not, and they made a bet, and of course he won because it was a black hole. If, uh, <laughs> well, the story is much longer, but uh, I don't have time. <laughs> But I mean, it's, it's curiosity, no? Hawking always saying that, uh, that uh, black holes exist. He could not really believe that, that there was a detection from a black hole. So uh, to me, it's a, it's a bit curious. So the thing is that, for example, uh, Cygnus X1, uh, uh, so it, it displays uh, this, this, this jet f uh, that shapes the surrounding uh, uh, interstellar medium. And for the moment, uh, well, when I made this slide, that was already some time ago, there have been uh, some transient episodes detected by, by Agile when the source was in hard state, so when you have the jets and when you start moving towards the softer uh, uh, state, and the thing is that with Fermilat, with Fermilat, you do not really detect single transient events, but you need to accumulate a lot of data. So the first time it was discovered was accumulating 7.5 years of data uh, during the hard state and during the soft state, and you can see that actually during the hard state you can detect it. No, and in this case the 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 emission it's a uh, is likely from inverse quantum on the stellar photons. Although you might expect a different component at higher energies. At higher energies, a long time ago, MAGIC saw a 4.9 sigma significance, 4.9, and we didn't claim a detection, okay? So, <laughs> uh, in only 80 minutes of observation, okay? Uh, it was simultaneous to a hard X-ray X -ray flare, also during one of these hard states where you have the, the jet emission. And then after accumulating more than 100 of hours during the hard state mainly, we have not yet detected Cygnus X1. But, so this says that either you need to accumulate much, 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 much more hours to be able to detect it, but uh, it's transient emission is still possible. So this that we kind of saw in here, uh, it's still possible to be detected. So we are still trying to get transient emission from a microquasar. So, so uh, 
For example, this unique system that I was telling you about uh, displays MEV emission but has not been detected at higher energies. Uh, Cygnus X1 displays GV emission but not TV, and we have not detected any low mass X ray any low mass X ray binaries. But one of the highlights also, I would say, in the last few years, has been the detection of, of SS433. It's a microquasar that displays these two relativistic jets, which are uh, steady. They are always there. Uh, it's a critical material from a companion star. These are some. This is a, a, a real uh, radio image of the jet. And the system is inside a, a supernova remnant. And these jets are interacting with the supernova remnant in two, in two points. Here you can see, I think these are the, the radio contours. And this is the X-ray emission, OK? So actually, at very high energies, uh, you know that there are non-thermal processes at work already because you have radio, you have X-rays, so you could expect emission from either the central binary no? or also from the interaction regions. Uh, at high energies, there were a lot of uh, oh, so this slide is a bit old also. Uh, at high energies, there were a lot of people analyzing Fermilab data and claiming that, yes, it was detected here, it was detected in another place. Uh, now there was a paper, this, because this was from a conference, now there is a paper, okay, saying that actually you see the high energy emission is not located here, is not located here, is not located here, but it's located here in this part of the nebula. And, they say, and, and actually they see that this uh, emission here is pulsating with the same precession, uh, precessional period that the, that the jet. Cool. But well, now we know that SS-433 is a high energy emitter and uh, ha there, has been a lot of there have been a lot of campaigns for, for many times. For example, HES and MAGIC did a centra, uh, um, a common uh, uh, um, uh, observations to see if we could detect it, if we could not. Uh, and then Hawk detected it. Hawk also having nice results. So uh, near SS433, they have this super big milag uh, Milagro source, uh, Milagro all experiment that they de detected the source. If you remove the contribution, you, you could actually see emission in the, in the interaction regions. And uh, their emission was a five sigma, so they could only put one spectral point in here, but it was already shocking. You can actually you can detect microquasars at 25 tera electron volts. So, what's going on here? Why we haven't detected it? Well, has detected it, and they claim uh, they showed the results in this in a conference last year. But you just really needed to integrate much more time. Has uh, you, you has observed for about 300 hours to detect this emission, but what you can see here is that actually Hess has a better PSF than Hog, so you can actually uh, see a little bit better the the shape of the. So this is the 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 point, the big points by by Hog, and with Hess you can really see a little bit better how the emission looks like, and they obtain this very nice uh, spectrum. And they measure the spectrum between 800 giga electron volts and 50 tera electron volts. So this is the first microquasar ever seen by a Cherenkov telescope. Um, just a few short words. Uh, there are some expectations also to have neutrino emission in microquasars, and uh, there are some results by by by, by IceCube. I, you can check the the paper. Uh, they have not detected any emission coming uh, coincident with any microquasar, um, but I think it's uh, really nice to 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 read if you are interested in in the topic. And now let me be super fast uh, with Novi. It's one of the, the most recent results, I would say, we have in the, in the field regarding binaries. Uh, uh, so Novi are these thermonuclear explosions that happen when you have a white dwarf that is accreting material from a companion star. So this uh, material, which is hydrogen, is being accumulated on the surface of the white dwarf. And at some point, this, uh, this, uh, the, uh, there is an ignition of the hydrogen. And then there is this uh, thermonuclear uh, explosion. Uh, depending on the companion star, we can classify them into symbiotic binaries. 
if you have a red giant, and then this red giant it has a wind, and so the whole system is like embedded inside the wind of this red giant. Or you can, co you can uh, have classical novae in the case of having a low mass star as a companion. These outbursts can last several weeks, up to several months, and in general, most of the novi, most novi events have been detected only once, okay? Um, there are some novi that have been repeated, that have shown repeated outbursts in what we say is a human timescale, so, and this is what we call recurrent novi. We think that all novi are recurrent at some point, but maybe some of them are recurrent and af after 1,000 years, okay? But at some point, they should all be recurrent. So, uh, the first nova that was ever detected at high energies was a V407 Cygni by Fermilat. Uh, it was a symbiotic system, so red giant with a wind and system inside the wind. Uh, and this was a nice result because established Novi as a new source emitting at high energies. And then a few years later, they also detected some classical Novi. Uh, as you can see here, Fermi tried to fit the hadronic model or a leptonic model, and the fit was not pretty, pretty good. So the emission could not really, was not really, uh, uh, well defined. And as you can see, Fermilab only detected the emission up to 10 giga electron volt. So, uh, the obvious question can they emit at even higher energies? Um, so, for many years, all of Cherenkov telescopes were trying to detect NOVA at very high energies. Um, we have a lot of theories saying that yes, we should, uh, which we could uh, expect them. If you have a hadrons, pro uh, no, if you have a hadronic scenario, protons can really reach super high energies. So if there is proton acceleration, you can de you can indeed de detect gamma rays, or maybe you can have a second component in your spectrum. Uh, so for many years we were searching, and last year, no, last year, no, already 2021, uh, Ares of Fiuki, which is a recurrent symbiotic nova, so symbiotic because you have the red giant, recurrent because it showed outbursts every 15 years, enter in, uh, in outbursts, and this was already uh, theorized to be a good uh, GEV candidate, so we were really hoping for this system. And Indeed, this is the first nova that is detected at very high energies. You see here the, in red the, the Hess uh, light curve, and here the Fermilat light curve. And in here you see the magic light curve in daily in red, Fermilat, and some optical. And you can see how you have this peak in the emission and then the decay in uh, that is seen at high energies and in opticals. And one difference between HES and MAGIC is that HES detected it at higher energies than MAGIC. MAGIC observed it and detected it at even at slightly lower energies. So NOVI are now established as a new type of very high energy emitter. Uh, so what's going on? So you have your, your red giant that is accreting the material onto the white dwarf and at some point, well, this is the material being accreted, it's being accumulated, as I said, in the white dwarf. And then at some point, there is just this, this blast or this uh, thermonuclear runaway. And uh, what we think is happening is that you have uh, your, so this is your white dwarf that is, has a photosphere emitting some thermal radiation, your red giant with all of the wind in the system, and this is the ejecta from this NOVA event, and it's in the shock where you can have either electrons or protons being accelerated and producing the, the gamma rays. And of course the emission in general is not, um, is not um, uh, uh, it's, you cannot expect a spherical thing because you have the 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 the, the, the plane in which you have the the the, 
the material being accreted, where you have your accretion disk, so you must expect some asymmetry. So for the modeling, we tested, we injected protons, we injected electrons, and uh, the protons would interact with the nova ejecta, with some contribution of the white, uh, of the red giant wind, and the electrons will work on inverse quantum emission on the thermal, on the photosphere from from the from the white dwarf. And uh, basically, what we saw, let me just move a little bit, is uh, this is the, the Fermilat emission, this is the magic emission, and you see here that the hadronic scenario is much best fit than the leptonic one. Uh, the emission is really smooth in the case of from Fermilat to magic, and we can describe it as a single component from 50 mega electron volts to 250 giga electron volts. And, uh, it, it doesn't only give a better fit, but in the case of the hadronic scenario, as Brian was saying this morning, uh, the uh, uh, particles uh, uh, can fall on this minus two spectra. This is what happens here, which, so, which is very natural to protons. In the leptonic scenario, we needed to assume some spectral breaks ad hoc, and then even assuming these things ad hoc, which were not so natural, you got a, better, a worse fit. Uh, uh, daily, we also fit better the hadronic emission. Uh, let me go fast because I, I want you to have time to ask questions too. So this proves that actually protons are accelerated in NOVA and that the emission that we detect is due to protons being accelerated. When we compare this NOVA to other NOVI, uh, we do not see anything very special. Let me, okay. Uh, this in red here, it's the Ares of Yuki. So it was the brightest one. It was the one with the, with the highest flags, highest flags, the brightest one. But apart from that, we do not see anything, anything special. So the good thing is that if we have another bright nova, we will be likely able to detect it. And uh, yeah, and how this, contribute to the galactic cosmic ray spectrum. Of course, you have protons being accelerated, and novae are not so energetic as uh, supernovae, but they, are, they happen much more often, so you could expect some contribution. However, when you look at the energetics of the, of the nova, they are much lower than, than supernova, and we made a calculation that is less than a 0 0.2 of the contribution of supernovae to cosmic rays. But however, even if they do not really contribute to the overall uh, Cosmic, uh, cosmic ray spectrum, what we saw is that actually they enhance the cosmic ray uh, density in their closed environment. So they create bubbles of few parsecs of extension. And in the case of recurrent novae, such as Ares of Iuki, these bubbles can reach up to uh, 10 parsecs, which is indeed uh, quite already a reasonable, uh, a reasonable uh, um, number. So. Uh, this is the, how uh, the, the detection uh, by HES, the, I already showed you the light curve, and this is what the spectra look like for the first night and how it evolved for the last night. And HES uh, also uh, says that the hadronic scenario is preferred, so we know that protons are indeed uh, 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 accelerated there. And then the, the large size telescope one, so if you remember this big new telescope that we have from, for CTA, also observed it and also detected it. So uh, you see that it's working, it's working fine. You can see here how the, in blue, how the emission fits with the magic and the HES, in the HES results. So even if it's still in commissioning, they are getting nice results. And of course in Novi you can also expect some neutrinos, you have some protons being accelerated, so you can also have some neutrinos coming from there. Uh, you can have a look to these uh, papers where you can claim emission. But uh, well, there was a, a, a report by IceCube saying that they had not detected any, any. And in our model we also tested if we would have expected something, but the, the expected uh, the expected flux is uh, below the limits of, of uh, current uh, experiments. Uh, and then just to finish, uh, colliding wind binaries uh, like Eta Carina, which is the system in the south, it was detected for the first time by Agile and Fermilab, and HES has also detected it. And actually, colliding wind binaries, there might be a little bit more, but this is for the moment the only system that we, that we know that is emitting uh, at very high energies. Um, 
which is actually two bright stars, just a luminous blue variable and a, and a O or B type companion. And it's just because of their strong winds and, and that the material is, is heated and it's where you have the gamma ray emission. And then, of course, we have a lot of unidentified sources because you can have, uh, there are regions in which you have source confusion. As I was telling you yesterday, most, of like, most likely supernova remnants, pulsar wind nebula, maybe star forming regions. And yeah, so just to finish, I didn't put a summary of what we saw, but I want you also to, to see that uh, there is still a lot of things to do. There are many, we have, over the last few years, we have detected it many things. We have detected novi, we have detected different kinds of uh, micro, uh, we have detected a microquasar, we have done uh, many discoveries uh, regarding pevatrons, but there is uh, still a lot of sources that we are really hoping to detect in the next few years. So I stop here if you have any question. Questions? Work? Yeah, thank you for a wonderful lecture. So, as you mentioned, LASSO release a new catalog of the newly detected sources very first time. Mm -hmm. So, I just want to know, like, uh, uh, why Hoke was unable to detect these sources earlier, but uh, Lasso was able to detect these sources? Is it because of uh, Lasso have multiple sources and uh, due to the better advancement of the instrumentation, it was able to detect in its first uh, year observation, but uh, uh, Hoke was not able to detect? Or I is it due to the location of the uh, the observatory of the lasso and the hawk, was dif hawk is different. It's basically a matter of sensitivity. Oh, okay. It's basically that if you see, uh, uh, well, lasso has a much bigger detector, has a much uh, better sensitivity. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so in only one year, they beat the sensitivity the five the sensitivity of hawk in five years for for a big factor, especially at high, at very high energies. So it's just a matter of sensitivity. If you give Hawk a few more years, they will likely detect a lot of them. Okay. But okay. Yeah. Thank you. More yeah. questions? And you see that now there is a, there, there, are, they, there, there is a project also to build this one, this Swigo, uh, that has also very good sensitivity, the expected sensitivity is also pretty good. So, and this will be constructed in the, here in South America. Uh, hi, hi, great lecture. Uh, from the NOVA scenario, you told us uh, recently it was a red giant white dwarf, but it is possible to be another type of star or like, uh, like there are models about that? <laughs> And in the case of Novi, you mean? Yes. Yes. Yeah, you can actually have low ma a low mass companion. When you have a low mass companion, it can also accrete the material on the white dwarf. You can also have these uh, thermonuclear explosions. Um, and uh, yeah, this is what I show you here. Um, <coughs> let me go fast. That indeed Fermilat um, have already detected this classical, this classical novi. So the first one that they detected was also a symbiotic one with a red giant, but uh, the other ones that they, detect, that they published in this paper in 2014 were classical, which were also like a kind of a surprise because uh, in the case of symbiotic binaries, you have the red giant with all of this wind that is also contributing somehow to, to, to the, to the to the acceleration of particles. In the case of classical novi, you do not have this radiation field, this additional radiation field, but still they, they were detected. So the next goal at very high energies is detecting a classical nova. <laughs> <laughs> comments, more comments, questions? You have a question? <laughs> uh, 
in the magnetar model where you have these ejections, do you have, is there a model for, is there a sense to how uh, the amount of material, the time frames that of these ejections, are they mostly just um, uh, hydrogen gas or <laughs> electrons or is there a, a sense of the, uh, how much of, uh, in terms of a solar mass, is this something significant in terms of solar mass or just a tiny amount of material that creates a lot of energy that generates? Yeah, I, I cannot tell you the right number right now because uh, it, uh, I'm very bad at reminding these kind of things, <laughs> but uh, we can check, but yeah, there, there, are, there are many th models on this, on this kind. But, uh, lucky, but we are uh, lacking models at very high energies, so there, there are some predictions and so, but uh, we don't have any strong modeling f for our case, so.